The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. I'd like to share with you a little bit of an episode that uh, took place right here in this shul a few years back. At that time, we were starting a new shul. At that time, you know, we came up with all different types of ideas that would really, I guess, bring out the best in a lot of the young guys that we were fortunate to work with. There's a story that I have told over in the past, but I think to this particular theme, it, it, it does wonderful justice. You know, in the beginning, I used to speak in the shul Friday night, and Shabbat day, and Shabbat afternoon, and now before Mecha. See, they really wanted to make sure the rabbi works. And so that shul is eat. Then I told the guys, you know what? How about... By Sudat Shalishit, we do something novel, something unique, something new, something interactive, something that will really help our guys. I said, okay, Rabbi, well, what, what do you have? So what do you think about this? How about every week, every Shabbat, we nominate another guy in the shul to come up to speak? He has a whole week to prepare. It all has to be as a short, simple, Dvar Torah, Actually, he can talk on anything he wants, anything he's comfortable with, as long as it's somewhat Torah-related, an idea, a concept, a mitzvah, whatever he's passionate about. Come up and speak. And you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how much talent our guys have. And they're going to come up, and they're going to put their hearts in front of the tzibur, and you'll see that they will shine. They like the idea. And we decided that that week we started. We started with one guy, a guy by the name of Albert Hadri, who delivered an unbelievable dirasha. And the place was floored. They couldn't believe it. These young guys that were just out of high school a year or two or three, and they were up by the pulpit, and they were delivering their Dvar Torah and their messages, and they were stars. And they gained a tremendous amount of confidence. And this went on for quite some time. Matter of fact, it goes on till today. Till today, years, five years later. And the system is still going. Because when it works, it works. But there was one week. One week that I'll never forget. We went, we asked a guy. At that time, he was single. At that time, we knew that it was going to take a lot of pushing to really plead and beg with this particular guy to get up and speak. He was a great salesman. He had it in him to speak beautifully. But we knew it wasn't going to be easy to get him to give a Dvar Torah. That already is a whole different... Such a funny thing, you know? Such a funny thing, you know? Like one time I had a, <laughs> I had a father that came to me and he said to me, Rabbi, I, I don't know. Friday night by my meal, on Shabbat, no matter what I do, I can't get my kids to sing. I can't get my kids to sit for two minutes. Shabbat by me, the whole thing, the table is just a plop, plop, in and out. We grab, we eat, we run. He said, I don't get it. I looked at the guy and I said, I, I, I don't get it. You don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand. I said, you are one of the top salesmen in the community. Supposedly they say that you sell, I don't know how many millions of dollars a year, to every type of chain store in the country. You're the number one man. They say that you're so good that you are one of those guys that can sell ice to an Eskimo. And yet, to sell your own son on a Shabbat table, on a Samzmiro, on a beautiful, warm experience, that you can sell to your own son. It's amazing how we have so much talent and we use it for anything and everything we want. But when it comes to a little bit of Avodat Kodesh, all of a sudden people make themselves dumb. All of a sudden we make ourselves inadequate. So I turned to this young guy. This guy was a cool kid, originally a street boy, pulled himself together, he's making some money, successful boy. He's learning now at nights. And I turned to him, listen, 
we want you to speak this week. And I know you're going to do a great job. He looks at me and says, Rabbi, don't even go there. You know how many guys asked me already to speak? They were after me for months. The answer is no, I can't do it. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. What am I going to say? I'm going to get up there and make a fool of myself in front of the whole shul. Forget it. It's not happening. I said, listen to me. You know, like my mother once told me, try it once. If you like it, I'll give you seconds. If you don't like it, then leave it. But once, you owe it to yourself. You can do this. And guess what? You're going to make everybody amazed by how well you're going to do it. But give it a shot. What do you have to lose? It's one week. Everybody's going around in a circle. After pushing and pushing, he decided he'll do it. And that, that week, he spent his time preparing this Dvar Torah. And then it came that moment of truth, Shabbat afternoon. The shul was packed. And he got up there. And I saw how nervous he was. And I saw how his fingers were shaking. And I saw he was already clearing his throat. And I was watching his lips. I saw that he started palpitating. I saw his breath go thin. I saw all the signs of a speaker sweating it out, getting up in front of a tzibor. And this poor guy, Hazik, was going through it all. And I started to say to Helene for the guy, I, I felt so bad. I felt so bad that I pushed him to get up there. And I, I felt so, and he was, he, was, he was really sweating it through. But I said to myself, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And he took a deep breath and he pulled out this little piece of paper from the inside pocket and he began to open up the folds. And he looks at the paper and he looks out at the tzibor and he looks back at the paper. And he takes a deep breath and he opens his mouth and nothing comes out. And I said, oy vey. Oh boy, this poor guy. Please, hang in there. Try, give me one more shot. I was praying for the kid. He took another breath. But this time, the voice came out. And he began to read. And he started from the very beginning of his piece. And slowly but surely, line by line. In the beginning, he was terribly nervous. I saw his lips were trembling. His fingers holding the paper were trembling. After that, once he started to get into it, little by little, all of a sudden he started to take command of his dirasha. He started to feel the words. He started to give off a certain warmth and a positive vibe to everyone that he believes in the point he's delivering and this is something he's passionate about. And he started to live the dirasha. And then as he started getting to the end, he started to put his heart into it, and his voice started to go up, and his voice started to come down. And suddenly, suddenly, a speaker was born. And at the end of that dirasha, he was so good that the entire room jumped on top of him when he finished, and they hugged him, and they gave him a hazaku baruch, and they put their arms around him. And literally, if it was a bar mitzvah, they would have picked him up on a chair. And you saw the look on this guy's face. This guy looked like he climbed Mount Everest. This guy looked like he climbed the biggest hurdle in his life. He had a smile from ear to ear, and this guy refused to stop smiling throughout the rest of the night, our beat. It was a guy that was at the top of his game. Ah, amazing. Ladies, I want to tell you the end of this story. The next morning, Sunday morning, I got a call from this particular guy. And he says to me, Rabbi, I got to talk to you. Listen to me. I'm very ashamed to tell you this. And uh, I'm going to be very candid. I'm going to tell it to you straight. I think I owe it to you. You know, before Shabbat on Friday, I got a call from my friends. You know, we're working all week. We don't get to see each other. But on weekends, we go out together to the city. It's the only time that we have to really enjoy. From Friday already, I had plans with my friends that there was a club in the city, and we already made reservations and VIP rooms and all different types of things. He says, Rabbi, I'm very embarrassed because I know that was definitely not a place that you think I'd ever go to, or any good Jewish boy for that matter. 
But we had plans and reservations to go. And I was going. I was going. And then came Shabbat. And then came Su'udat Shalushi. And he says, I'll tell you the truth. In my mind, I thought that I'd simply get up there, pull out the paper, get the rabbi off my back, just deliver the speech, leave me alone, and that's it. I don't want to hear from you guys for another 10 years. He says, but when I pulled out that paper, and I started to read the words of that Dvar Torah, he says, I don't know what happened to me. As I started to read, as I started to get into it, the words started getting into me. And I started to feel it. And I felt something that I've never felt before in my life. Rabbi, I have to admit it to you. There was a certain emptiness inside of me. But that Su'udat Shalishit, I felt fulfilled for the first time in my life. I never had a feeling like that before. And Rabbi, at the end when I finished, and I know I finished on a high note, and I know I enjoyed giving that dirasha, but the moment that the whole place jumped up, and they jumped on me, and they gave me high fives, and they were hugging me, and Hazaku Baruch, and I saw it was genuine. It was real. I felt like I, 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 felt like I won a lottery. I felt like a million dollars. I never felt that good in my life. Rabbi, you want to hear something? When I got home that night, right after Havdalah, my friends called me. Hey, yo bro, we're outside. We're waiting for you. Let's go. We got reservations. He says, I'm thinking to myself, after that, you're going to give a better speech than me one day. <laughs> I thought to myself, after that, my friends called me up. Let's go. Come outside. We're going. We got reservations. We got to go. I said to myself, I can't go. After what I just tasted, after what I just felt, I can't go. I told my friends, you know what, guys? Go on without me. I'll catch up with you. They said, what? What happened to you? What's going on? Why are you pushing us off? I said, no, no, it's all, it's all good. I'm, just, I'm not feeling well. I'm this. I'm not making excuses. I said, Rabbi, I don't know what you did to me. But I just couldn't go. After that, after what I tasted, when you taste the real thing, everything else is so artificial. When you're introduced to the real you, everything else is so meaningless, so empty. Says Borei Olam, Abraham Avinu, Lech, go. But you know what you're looking for? Lecha. Through the path that you're going to take, you're going to find yourself. But understand that the process of finding your greatness, of what you're capable of, of who you really are, is the choice of the direction and the path you're going. Choose wisely. He says, Rabbi, that minute the switch went on. That minute, that Sudat Shalishit, I became a different person. That night when my friends called, I wasn't interested anymore. I couldn't go anymore. But Rabbi, I want to tell you that after my friends left, and they thought I was crazy, that's it. Fat bil all the way. No, it's a joke. But they thought I was crazy. Rabbi, you know what I did that night? Do you know what I did with my Saturday night? All my friends were out in the clubs. You know what I did? That night, I sat down on the couch with my parents. And I said to my mother, Ma, I want you to hear something. She says, I reached into my pocket, and I pulled out the paper, and I opened up the paper. And I read the Dvar Torah again to my mother and to my father. He says, but I read it. I read it like I read it in shul. I read it with the oomph. I read it with the whole gusto. You know, my mother started crying. My father's jaw was on the floor. He looked at me like, what, <laughs> what happened to you? I'm going to talk to that rabbi. No, it's a joke. What happened to you? 
says, I, I never saw them so happy. They were proud. They were proud of me. That night, my mother was so taken, she called over her brothers. You know, there's always the uncles. She called over the brothers. Their brothers came over. They thought they were coming over for the regular Saturday night. Uh, ahue, ahue, you know. But they sat down and my mother said, listen to this. She points to me. I pulled out the paper from the inside. Yeah. Paper, opened it up. And I read the Dvar Torah again. So my, bro my uncles, they were looking at me like, wow. And the way I gave it over again, they were, they were floored. And every time I gave it over, I felt like a million dollars again and again and again. And Rabbi, you know what? It only gets better. I've never had anything in life that the more you have of it, the better it tasted. Everything else, it's the opposite. The more you have, the less and less the thrill dies out. But this was incredible. He says, I couldn't stop. I was like, I was like drunk on Torah. This is me, Rabbi. The guy that used to go out to the city every Saturday night. He says, I couldn't stop. So you know what I did, Rabbi? I did the unthinkable. He says, there was one Rabbi in high school, my 11th grade Rebbe. That one time I made so much trouble in his class years earlier that he got so angry at me and he said to me, there's nothing ever going to come out of you. I went to his house that night. I knocked on his door. It was 11 o'clock at night. It was late. Hazik, the rabbi, came out in a rope. I said, Rabbi, you remember me? He said, sure, I remember you. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in I don't know how many years. What's going on? Rabbi, can I just speak to you for a few minutes? The rabbi took me into a study. I sat down with him. I said, Rabbi, I'll tell you why I came here tonight. And before I could even say a word, I reached into my pocket again. And I pulled out that paper. And I opened up again on the crisis. And I began to read that Dvar Torah for the fifth time that night. And I read it. And oh, did I deliver it in front of my Rebbe. And I gave it all I had. He says, when I finished, and I got to the end, and I said the beautiful ending of this Dvar Torah, I looked up at the Rebbe, and my Rebbe started crying. And with tears, he got up, he grabbed my hands, and we started to dance together inside his study. He says, Rabbi, I promise you, at that minute, there was nothing in the world that you can give me that I would have traded for that moment and that Simhat Torah dance. That's a Jew that the, the switch was flipped and the path was chosen. And now says Bore Olam, Lech Lecha. You want to find out who you are. You want to find out what you're capable of. You want to find out your inner unbelievable potential and what you really could be doing in life and living in life. It all depends on you. Lech, your choice. You want to find yourself? You have to choose the path you're going to take. And that's the land. You got to find your destination. You got to find your path. And that's going to mold to you the person who you'll become. Look at this guy. If he would have continued going in the path that he was going, he would have became one person. Or Hashem, for that one Sudashali Shi, the switch went on and he chose a new path. And today I can tell you, he became somebody else completely. Today his lecha changed. you know why? Because his lech changed. This was the secret that Borei Olam was telling Abraham Avinu. El ha'aretz asher ar eka. It's up to you where your destination will be. You want to find yourself? You have to choose the path you're going to take. That's going to make you who you are. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire dot org